So we're talking about organic transformations. Okay? And what we discovered was that um, uh, the organic transformations, uh, again, are defined by all the transformations that will leave the metric invariant, the, the, the flat metric invariant. And what we found was that uh, by just as we did for the rotation group, we were able to show that if uh, we write this as the exponential of sum, the sum of generators, the generators with both indices lowered are uh, anti-symmetric matrices, uh, but this is with both indices uh, lowered. Right. And so what we discovered was that basically this allowed us to write, write it as um, the exponential um, a bunch of parameters uh, uh, summed over the generators. Right. These are the parameters generators and in particular what's uh, uh, a useful form uh, for us to use is in 3 plus 1 dimensions uh, this works in all dimensions but in 3, di 3 plus 1 dimensions 3 space and 1 time dimension what we usually end up doing is to write it in terms of uh, rapidity uh, Daughter into the boost. So there are three directions you can boost. Right? And, and this is uh, the corresponding rapidity parameter. Uh, this is called rapidity. Um, it's the C that occurs in just just uh, to review what we did the other day. This is the one dimensional case. So this is the boost. If this is one plus one dimension, this is the boost in the x direction. Right? This is time, this is uh, time, time, this is space time, uh, time, space, space time. And so this is just the boost in the spatial direction. So this C is the C over here. And this C is uh, runs over all all the real all the real numbers. Okay. And I noticed some confusion uh, about this uh, uh, regarding the volume of the group. But uh, let me finish saying this first and, and then I'll say a few words about that. Um, and then this is the rotation uh, parameter. So this is the rotation angles. These are the rotation generators. Okay. So this part, without the K part, I hope is now a bit more familiar to you guys. So we've we'll talked quite a bit about rotations as a warm-up to actually this discussion over here. So without the K, this is just what we've been spending quite a bit of time talking about. But so now Lorentz transformations, at least the continuous part of the Lorentz group, um, is to be associated with both boosts and rotations. This then together that gives you the full uh, what's called the proper Lorentz group. Right. So uh, yeah. So I should say this is the proper Lorentz group. I should mention what I mean by that. Maybe I'll do it over here. So if you look at, just, just as a brief aside, um, um, or maybe I should conclude this uh, discussion first. So just as a reminder, uh, the translation, so these omegas obviously will translate into the C and the theta, but that will require first identifying what the J's are. Right? So again, J, A, B, is related to these generators by simply contracting 
the uh, yeast generators uh, with the Nagashimita symbol, right? And so for now, uh, epsilon one to three is still one. Right? Later on, uh, it, it might, uh, we'll have the four dimensional guide, but we'll do that in a, in a, in a bit. And then the J zero I part is in fact the boost. Okay, so in other words, what used to be just rotations in uh, space directions, now you have to extend it into the time direction. So that's why you now have the zero component, right? But there's no zero, zero because um, it's an anti-symmetric guy, right? So this guy is an anti-symmetric, so zero, zero, zero. And so you only have, when you extend to the time direction, you only have the zero i and the uh, and, uh, i zero direction. But i zero and zero i is just uh, opposite sign to each other. So this is the boost and this is the rotation. So once you know that this is true, then you can read off what is omega. Right? So basically omega omega uh, zero i uh, is related to um, C i. Right? And uh, which I'm going to define as C i. Uh, I. I don't, in these parameters, I don't want to be too picky about what I mean by up and down steps. And then uh, omega i j, is in fact uh, related to the rotation angle. So epsilon i j k theta k. Right? That's, what, that's what it means. Okay. Um, so this is uh, a part review, but this is where we left off the last time. But in particular, uh, we also went on to note that uh, the Lorentz algebra um, uh, is similar to um, uh, Euclidean space, uh, but sorry, is is uh, yeah actually this related to Euclidean uh, rotations, but uh, because the special relativity metric has an opposite sign in the time component, it is not the same. Right, so but just to remind you guys, um, what we showed was that the Lie algebra, oh I didn't really show it, but I wrote down what it is. Um, although we did discuss how you can how you can derive it, right? So the first thing to do is to write down a matrix representation of this guy based on your understanding that this matrix uh, uh, has to be anti-symmetric if you lower both indices. And uh, so for example, the matrix, yeah, so the matrix representation will be J mu nu alpha beta, and I believe for the minus i would be anti-symmetric. So it would be mu nu alpha beta, and then you anti-symmetrize alpha beta. Actually, if you enter symmetrize either alpha beta or mu nu, you get the same answer. And they will both be, uh, they'll be anti-symmetric in both mu nu and alpha beta. Okay? But once you have this representation, then you can work out explicitly that the multiplication rules, this basically uh, determines the multiplication rules of your group element. Right? And it looks like this, right? this eta, mu rho and then mu sigma uh, minus eta mu rho j mu sigma plus eta mu sigma j mu rho minus eta mu sigma and this, in this form, it's hard to see. But if you run it in terms of these guys, and then you redefine j plus minus i to be one half of j i plus or minus i k i, then what you discover is that this, if you plug this into that, you will discover for yourself that, in fact, 
becomes equivalent to the following. Right? So this, this will become this. And this is where you left off at the beginning. And so this is the part where it looks very similar to rotations except that we now have two pairs of rotation generators. So they commute, so they decouple, so the plus and minus decouples, but the plus and minus uh, themselves form a rotation, uh, something that looks like the rotation group. Okay, so uh, let me just remind you what that means. So if you have taken quantum mechanics, I know some of you have not taken quantum mechanics, but I don't want to keep saying it because I, I don't want to uh, sound like I'm giving you guys a hard time. So um, what what that means, okay, so it's like, so let me just say, this is like two copies of the big algebra for rotations, uh, in particular SO3. Right? So remember SO3 is rotations. And um, in fact, we, we also noted this when we got the when we first analyzed the rotation group and explained that uh, what determines the multiplication rules of the uh, group elements are the Lie algebra the, of the generators. I showed you that you you get exactly these guys. But now, uh, this is only a mathematical analogy, right? The real rotations, these are the actual rotations. This is the real, these are the real rotations. It's just that when you run it this way, it now looks like the rotation uh, uh, generators. Um, uh, the reason why we need I is exactly because K itself will turn out uh, for our case not to be permission. Okay, and um, uh, yeah, it's not a permission generator. But, uh, but once you get into this form, this will turn out to be permission as you will see. Uh, you will see an explicit, uh, some explicit examples later on, especially for fermions. But, once you have this algebra and you know these guys are permission, then there are uh, some things that you might remember from quantum mechanics, uh, or if you don't know from quantum mechanics, now I'll tell you. Um, so, so what the, the, the conclusion is, I will skip over the algebraic derivation. Right? If you're interested, it's actually in my notes. Um, uh, I can point you to them, but I'll tell you the, the main conclusions. Once you have this algebra, and just from this algebra alone, you can deduce the following, that uh, there must be two labels, and maybe I, for this purpose, I'd better call it S, S plus or minus, and then there will be an M plus or minus. Okay, and so what that means is that, uh, let me just do it, just in case it's confusing. Um, let me do it for the class case first. So there will be a set of eigenstates of these guys, and such that the I, there will be the eigenvalue will be s plus s plus plus one, and this is what we call spin. Usually, that's what we call spin because it comes from rotation, uh, and then this will be s plus s plus and plus, and then usually we will choose the third direction. Um, because they don't commute. So if you run A and B through one, one through three, these guys don't commute amongst themselves. So you can only choose one of them. You can choose J plus one if you want. You can choose two if you want. But usually the convention is that we choose a third guy. Okay, the third, the Z axis. And this will act on the same eigenstate to give you M plus. And what is M plus? M plus is a number that will run between S plus uh, and minus S plus. 
And what is S plus itself? S plus itself you can show, can take either integer values or half integer, but strictly non-negative. So zero, so this spin zero, spin half, spin one, spin three halves, uh, five halves, oops, I'm sorry, uh, uh, two, and then, and so on. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, of course, in nature, we only know spin zero, spin half, spin one, uh, and maybe spin two. Okay, so uh, I certainly think spin two exists, otherwise you won't be stuck to the earth. Uh, but even spin, spin three halves, uh, I don't think we know any fundamental particles like that. There are higher spin states of hadronic, hadronic uh, particles, but these are not fundamental particles. Like they are, they are um, composite objects. Uh, but they are higher spins if you care about hadronic states, meaning quark and gluon bound states. Uh, these these guys exist, and they give you the higher spin states. But uh, at a fundamental level, we don't know of um, um, elementary particles other than spin zero, half, one, and maybe maybe two. Um, people would debate whether the graviton is is fundamental or not. But but uh, so let's just say up to spin one. Right? This is this is uh, this is known. Uh, so we are going to uh, study uh, different types. The reason why we talk about symmetry so much is because this actually classifies. Uh, let me let me put it as clearly as I can. So if you believe that Lorentz invariance, a Lorentz covariance, is a fundamental property of nature, then. Uh, you then this this kind of classification would tell you what kind of particles you can expect coming out of nature because um, these operators right now we're talking over here we're talking about the Lorentz transformation matrices themselves but these operators remember we will end up uh, act we will promote them operators acting on the Hilbert space of uh, the quantum the quantum field theories that we care about that describes elementary particles right so so and and those those operators have to have the same properties namely it has to give you these eigenvalues and these eigenvalues like I said are exactly the spin that we associate with elementary particles so it will take a while to get that, but I want to uh, lay it out first, uh, and that's why I do this. Um, but, uh, that's why I'm doing this, and and then and then uh, I hope by the end of next week we'll spend uh, uh, a bit of uh, effort to build up the direct equation because because that's the part I think which is the most. Um, most unusual and most uh, most difficult to, to understand. Uh, so we have already seen the klein gordon equation, which is spin zero, um, and then I'll eventually connect it to what we're doing over here after we quantize it. But um, let me just lay it out for you, summarize it for you, uh, what, what's, uh, what's going on here. Okay. Um, now, yeah. the uh, SU2 yeah. is uh, a double cover of SO3. Yeah. Could we say the Lorentz uh, algebra is, a, is a double cover of SO3? Um, this is, in fact, uh, we are, in fact, going to use uh, SU2. Spin half is essentially coming from SU2. Yeah, so, so uh, we'll get to it, actually. Uh, in other words, we are going to use the fact that uh, the SU2 is a double cover of SO3, uh, right? So this is SO, both SU2 and uh, SO3. Agree? This is the lead algebra. And it's the global topology that is different. The boundary conditions, when you rotate by 1 to pi, what do you get, right? Um, 
and and so um, we will in fact be using the SU2 to get the fermions. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions for me? Sorry, I want to go to my notes. Um, any other questions? No?
state in Hilbert space. So it's an abstract vector living in an abstract Hilbert space, but it represents for you uh, a particle. Uh, if, if you think about it in, in, in quantum mechanics, it's like a plane wave. But we don't we don't use we don't use this language quite. And don't don't quite use that language in, in quantum field theory. A, a little bit of it will show up, but but this is the fundamental description. If you want two particles, then it will be P1, P2. Three, it will be P1, P2, P3. Okay. And these are, in fact, you can see, infinite dimensional because it's labeled by P, right? and P can take any value you want. So therefore, it's immediately infinite. In fact, it's, it's, it's infinite in many ways because you can allow for arbitrary number of particles as well. So it's infinite in, in, in terms of the number of particles as well. Right. So this is infinite dimensional. And, and when I talk about spin zero, in fact, I mentioned that there is a corresponding operator, because those are matrices that I'm talking about. But when you ask, when you try to ask the question, how do I uh, uh, Lorentz transform uh, an abstract state in my Hilbert space? What will happen is that we'll construct something exactly like that, but then these j's and the exponential will now act on the uh, state themselves. So they're not matrices anymore, but they are actually now operators acting on the state. So, so let me just be more explicit. So this will look like e to the minus i over 2 omega mu nu, j mu nu, but now we'll be acting on the state p. And after acting on it, what you get, you get basically your Lorentz transform P. Right? That's, that's what it gets. But because it's now acting on this guy, you will find that now this guy is in fact unitary. This in fact will be unitary. Okay? And uh, so the omegas are still the parameters that you see here, right? because you need to describe exactly what Lorentz transformations you're talking about. So the parameters are the same. But the k and the j's, depending on what you're acting on, in that case, you're acting on the coordinates. You're boosting the coordinates, or you're boosting some four-component four um, vector, right? But in this case, the j's are operators that act on your p. And in fact, when you, when you now ask the question, what about these guys acting on this? This is exactly where the s will come in. Okay, so I only did the um, I only did the um, uh, spin zero case because it's very easy to talk about. There's no there's no spin to talk about because that's why it's easy. But so now uh, 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 what since you asked, so I may as well just say it here, which is that if you have higher spin, then what will happen is that these guys will now act on your spin and and spit out these these numbers. Okay, so these will be eigenstates of these guys. So the wild spin of which we'll construct explicitly, uh, hopefully over the next ne next uh, week or so, will in fact obey this. Right? So it, the wild spin of will have its momentum eigenstates. It will have a spin label, and like I said, the j's, these j's will now be operators acting on those states that will spit out the spin um, eigenvalue. Okay. Um, and that is why we classify these things. Because whatever we do, starting from the fundamental uh, definition of the Lorentz group, we're going to carry over and promote them to uh, operators acting on this practical uh, Hilbert space. And then, that, would, that is why it's going to be able to tell us what type of particles we have. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. The operator can be in the form of matrix, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th th this is an operator itself as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is an operator itself. Like I said, right? It's, it's, a, it's a finite dimensional operator. You can think of it. But now acting on, like I said, either space-time vectors or coordinates, right? But, um, but when we talk about quantum mechanics, when we're talking about operators acting on the Hilbert because of that, 
That's why only when we come to talk about the particle in the space, then these operators become uh, uh, unitary. The whole thing is unitary. The J's then become permission. So, so, so this, these J's are permission. When acting on the lift space. Okay, because it's infinite. Because it's infinite dimensional. Okay. But when when I talk about it in that context of acting on space-time vectors, four component guys and so on, they are finite dimensional and therefore cannot possibly be unitary. Okay, that's that's a key point. It cannot possibly be unitary. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me summarize what I want to say just now. So so uh, but it is it's closely related to the answer to these questions, which is that so what exactly are the allowed particle types, right? Um, and it's related to what I'm saying over there regarding spin. But uh, it does require uh, enlarging this discussion a little bit, which I want to just outline. Um, I probably won't uh, go into as much detail as I originally planned to, but, but um, I want to at least give you the, 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 main, the main points. Okay. okay, so what are the main points? Um, the um, first thing is that we need to also allow for we need to enlarge the group. So far, we've been only talking about this way, not this way. Um, we need to enlarge the group to what's called uh, the Poincaré group. And the Poincaré group is just Lorenz plus space time translations. So, uh, in terms of these symbols that we're using, um, let me start with the matrix representation first. I think it's a homework problem. Let me just check. You know, I have a bad habit of doing a homework right? So, let me try to avoid that bad habit by checking first. I know you guys want me to do a homework for you, okay? But, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, okay, so the Poincaré group uh, is the following, right? You take X cube, and you not only boost it, but you also, uh, you also translate it. So this is the Lorentz translation. This is the space, the translation vector. So I won't give too much details because it's the homework, but I think this is sufficient to tell you guys what to do. Okay. So what it turns out is that if you want to formalize this statement, if you want to run it out as a matrix operation in space time, it turns out that, uh, so for this guy is a four by four, this guy is a four by four, uh, if you are in three plus one dimensional space time. If you, are in, if you want to include translations, but you want to write this whole operation as a matrix, just like this guy is acting on this guy. What you do is the following: you write it as uh, you now promote your x into a. I'll put a script a on, on top. Uh, in my notes, I put this curly a, which I cannot write on the board. Uh, this guy is now the usual x mu, and then with a one in the fifth component. So this is now five components. Okay. 
And what you do is you then construct a matrix which I call pi, A tilde, B tilde. And this guy will look like the formula. It will look like lambda. So this is a 4 by 4 block, which is exactly this lambda over there. And then you put your space-time translation vector over here. Um, so I can write down mu nu, I guess. And then this will be 1, this will be 0. Okay. Your homework will be to figure out why this guy is a good, this and this definition together is a good way to represent this Poincaré transformation. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then what you will, what you will prove is that extending the uh, Morant group to the Poincaré group is still preserves the group structure. So pi forms and that also remain, means that you have to figure out what if you do this, this thing twice, right? Because you want, you want to figure out whether something is a group. You want to make sure that this operation is close under uh, 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 product, right? If you do it twice or thrice, you better still remain in the Poincaré group. Otherwise, it's not a group It's close under the, the, its own operations. So, uh, that is the way we define the Poincaré group. And, but in terms of operators, you will find that uh, pi itself can be written in terms of, uh, again, exponential of um, uh, a bunch of generators. Right? So the, the Poincaré group, uh, the Lorentz group part, you've seen before, so I'm just going to write it down. And for uh, the translation part, you would just write down I A mu P mu. And these guys, you have actually seen at least partly in quantum mechanics. Right? So if you're taking quantum mechanics, you will realize, you'll be told, you'll be, you'll, you'll have learned that momentum, the meaning of momentum is that it generates translations. Okay? And, and so the only difference between what you learn in quantum mechanics and here is that now you're not just generating uh, translation in space, but you also uh, generate translations in time. So these are generators of space-time translations, so space and time. not the right dimensions, and you'll be right. Uh, so this is why, this is how uh, some quantum mechanics books uh, motivate each bar also. So this is another way to think about each bar, which is that it's the constant you stick into H and to G to, to make the dimensions right. Because if you should think for yourself, what, are, what given what I've just written, what is the dimension of P? Right? And, and that is actually not that's actually not the uh, dimensions of momentum. Um, so what you find is that if you do stick in uh, H bar, then it becomes uh, the correct dimension. Uh, but, but I won't go there for the moment because my H bar is 1 anyway. Um, and it's not necessary. Here I claim it's not necessary to stick in the H bar. Right? Because so far I'm just talking about geometry and there's nothing quantum, not yet anything quantum in what I'm doing. But this side of the board is where I do want to promote it to something important. Uh, and, and so eventually we'll make contact. Right? But let me continue from here first. Uh, so it turns out that when you enlarge the group, then uh, I'm going to erase this, but I'm not going to erase this. Um, I'm going to show you what the whole, the whole group looks like. Yeah. What makes it unitary? You can you can show that it is unitary. It's something that you can prove. Yeah, I, I'm not doing it now, but but you can show it. 
So, yeah, so this is an also a good question because I forgot to say that this whole uh, business was uh, uh, analyzed by Wigna. So Wigna was, uh, uh, did a very, very important piece of uh, theoretical physics, which is that he showed that basically um, symmetry transformations uh, acting on uh, quantum mechanical systems have to be either unitary or, un or anti-unitary. So if you can believe Lorentz, uh, the Lorentz symmetry is a symmetry of nature, then when it's acting on your quantum mechanical system, it better be uh, either a unitary or an anti-unitary operator. And it turned out that the only anti-unitary thing that I know about is the time reversal operator. Uh, parity, Lorentz, and Poincaré uh, is all, all unitary, as far as I'm aware. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any other anti-unitary operators. Yeah. So it's a theorem, basically. You can prove that when, when it's acting on your Hilbert space, it has to be unitary or, or anti-unitary. Yeah. Good. So let me continue. So what I want to say is that uh, you can also go ahead and work out the algebra between the J's and the P's and the P's themselves. So if you learn quantum mechanics, you probably will know that translations obviously commute. Right? So, uh, but, but that is, I hope, fairly obvious. Right? But with, uh, if you learn, I just appeal to undergraduate physics. Right? If you add vectors, um, the addition of vectors commute. Right? V1 plus V2 is the same as V2 plus V1. And that itself is a statement that translations commute. Right, so, so what that means is that p mu commute over p nu has to be zero. This is just a statement that translations commute. Right, v1 plus v2 is the same as v2 plus v1. That's, that's basically a statement how I could want to uh, uh, do it in space time. Right, so That's basically it. Translations don't care uh, how which order you do them, but they don't they don't commute with these guys, and which is why you need to look up the algebra. Um, Uh, P alpha are not 
simultaneous observables.
but what, what you should have been taught is that actually the relativistic way to write it is to say is P mu P mu and the zero component is in fact energy uh, P zero is in fact energy uh, and P i is the spatial part of it and this will become M squared right? and so this is probably what you learned in, in, as an undergrad but this is in fact a relativistic uh, uh, relativistically invariant way to, to, to describe particles. So uh, if you, know, you also know that in, uh, uh, in the case where you have a massive particle, P mu itself, uh, can, you can choose a frame where P mu is just at rest meaning M, zero, 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 okay? So if, if, your, if, your, uh, if your state is not at rest, you can always choose to boost it. And it doesn't change, remember it doesn't change the analysis to this guy, because if your, since it commutes to everybody, right, so if I boost it, it has to be the same eigenvalue as uh, if I don't boost it, right? So this guy would I can, I can commute through, and whatever eigenvalue it gives me it has to be the same as if I just if I don't boost it, right? So the same it will spit out the same eigenvalue as if 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 I don't boost it. I'm just write it out just to be very clear. Right? I, I haven't told I haven't told you about the eigen then I'm going to put the subscript. Right? C is my Casimir operator. Uh, but since it commutes with everybody, if it acts on some boosted state, it will spit out the same eigenvalue as it doesn't if it if if you don't boost it, because it commutes with everybody. Right? So this is a key point. So you can exploit it to understand what are the range of eigenvalues you can get by boosting to a convenient frame. And in this case, if your map particle is massive, you will boost it to you will boost it to the rest frame. And what will happen is therefore uh, you can now look at, for example, P squared uh, on P on this state. I will already say it gives you m, m squared. But what about the Casimir operator, for example? So let's look at W first. Okay, so W, um, if you add W zero, uh, what is it? You will see that it's one half epsilon zero. But if this guy is zero, everybody else has to be a space index because you cannot have a repeated time index. Right, so if you have one zero, then everybody else has to be space, right? So it has to be i j k. And so therefore it's j i j p k and this guy now acting on, think about it, acting on your moment your p. Well p uh, p is now zero because it's now acting on these are only the spatial components. And the spatial components acting on P is zero because I boosted it to a to a rest frame. Okay, I boosted it into a rest frame. So this is in fact zero. But what about what about the I, the spatial components? This the I is one half epsilon I, and then now we've got to uh, think about the different possibilities. I um, uh, let's say zero A B J. A P B okay, plus epsilon i uh, A B zero. In other words, the zero can be either on the J or on the P. And I think I need a factor of two. Uh, <coughs> I need a factor of two over here. So I erase this and put a one half here. Um, J A B P zero. 
Okay. So when Wi acts on P, remember this is now energy. But en energy is now mass because I'm not in the rest frame. So Wi acting on P <laughs> will give me, uh, and this is zero because because again this act, these are the spatial uh, components. This is energy, so it gives me m over two, and then this is in fact uh, epsilon i a b zero. So up to a minus sign, up to a minus sign. This is just a usual angular momentum operator, right? Because epsilon i a b j a b, which is in fact what we call minus m j i acting on p. But I just want to square, so let's square it. Okay, so when I square it, um, let me erase this. Uh, when I square it, I can calculate now what it is. Uh, when I square it, because it may not be a high instead of this J, J i's. So it is the W mu W mu that is the I instead. But W mu W mu we have discovered in this acting on this state will give us what it will give us because W W0 is 0, WI, WI, so this is 0, so WI, WI acting on P is in fact now this guy here, minus, minus, minus is plus, so you get M squared, J squared acting on P, okay? But I just told you, sorry I erased it already, but I just told you over here, that from the angular length momentum algebra, j squared has the eigenvalues of spin, s times s plus 1. <clears throat> and this is exactly where spin comes from. Okay? So, uh, the, in other words, the, uh, the spin of a massive particle comes from the j squared acting on these guys that leaves the momentum un unchanged. Okay, so, and, and so, uh, so massive. So let me just write it down. So massive states. Massive states. Massive particles are labeled by. Uh, spin by spin s, and because of that, you also have an azimuthal number. M s can run from s to minus s, while spin s can be. Uh, remember, j squared can either be uh, zero, one half, one, three halves, and so on. Okay, and all these values can show up in your in your particles. D, and I'm completely out of time now, so let me see. Um, okay, I am out of time. Any questions for me? So next time I talk about the massless case. So the massive case, uh, again, basically comes down to studying uh, uh, rotations in three dimensions because of because of this. Okay, so there is a um, there is a whole business of formalizing it using little groups. So there's something called the little group. Let me just mention it. The little group is the group that leaves uh, the reference momentum invariant. Part that I'm not going to go into very much, but but in this case, basically, is this is this guy here the massive uh, uh, particle? You can always boost the rest of it, and you use this as your reference momentum. And it turns out that Whitmer showed that all the irreducible representations of the group that leaves this invariant will also be the representations of the bigger uh, Poincaré group. Okay. So it's a trick. He realized that you can just study the group that leaves this in, in there. And that 
representations, the representations of the cross of that. That's why only when we come to talk about the particle Hitler space, then these operators become uh, uh, unitary. The whole thing is unitary. The J's then become permission. So, so, so this, these J's are permission. When acting on Hilbert space, okay, because it's infinite, because it's infinite dimensional. Okay, but when when I talk about it in that context of acting on space-time vectors, four component guys, and so on, they are finite dimensional and therefore cannot possibly be unitary. Okay, that's, that's a key point. It cannot possibly be unitary. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me summarize what I want to say just now. So, so uh, but it, it's, it's closely related to the answer to these questions, which is that, so what exactly are the allowed particle types, right? Um, and it's related to what I'm saying over there regarding spin. But uh, it does require uh, enlarging this discussion a little bit, which I want to just outline. Um, I probably won't uh, go into as much detail as I originally planned to, but, but um, I want to at least give you the, 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 main, the main points. Okay. okay, so what are the main points? Um, the um, first thing is that we need to also allow for we need to enlarge the group. So far, we've been only talking about this way, not this way. Um, we need to enlarge the group to what's called uh, the Poincaré group. And the Poincaré group is just Lorenz plus space time translations. So, uh, in terms of these symbols that we're using, um, let me start with the matrix representation first. I think it's a homework problem. Let me just check. You know, I have a bad habit of doing a homework right? So, let me try to avoid that bad habit by checking first. I know you guys want me to do a homework for you, okay? But, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, okay, so the Poincaré group uh, is the following, right? You take X cube, and you not only boost it, but you also, uh, you also translate it. So this is the Lorentz translation. This is the space, the translation vector. So I won't give too much details because it's the homework, but I think this is sufficient to tell you guys what to do. Okay. So what it turns out is that if you want to formalize this statement, if you want to run it out as a matrix operation in space time, it turns out that, uh, so for this guy is a four by four, this guy is a four by four, uh, if you are in three plus one dimensional space time. If you, are in, if you want to include translations, but you want to write this whole operation as a matrix, just like this guy is acting on this guy. What you do is the following: you write it as uh, you now promote your x into a. I'll put a script a on, on top. Uh, in my notes, I put this curly a, which I cannot write on the board. Uh, this guy is now the usual x mu, and then with a one in the fifth component. 
So this is now five components. Okay. And what you do is you then construct a matrix which I call pi, A tilde, B tilde. And this guy will look like the formula. It will look like lambda. So this is a four by four block, which is exactly this lambda over there. And then you put your space-time translation vector over here. Um, so I can write down mu nu, I guess. And then this will be one, this will be zero. Okay. Your homework will be to figure out why this guy is a good, this and this definition together is a good way to represent this concurrent translation. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then what you will, what you will prove is that extending the uh, Moran's group to the Poincaré group is still preserves the group structure. So pi forms the group. And that also remain, means that you have to figure out what if you do this, this thing twice, right? Because you want, you want to figure out whether something is a group. You want to make sure that this operation is close under uh, 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 product. Right? If you do it twice or thrice, you better still remain in the Poincaré group. Otherwise, it's not remaining right there. It's closed under the, the, its own operations. So uh, that is the way we define the Poincaré group. And, but in terms of operators, you will find that uh, pi itself can be written in terms of, uh, again, exponential of um, uh, a bunch of generators. Right? So the, the Poincaré group, uh, the Lorentz group part, you've seen before, so I'm just going to write it down. And for uh, the translation part, you would just write down I A mu P mu. And these guys, you have actually seen at least partly in quantum mechanics. Right? So if you're taking quantum mechanics, you will realize, you will be told, you will, you will have learned that momentum, the meaning of momentum is that it generates translations. Okay? And and so the only difference between what you learn in quantum mechanics and here is that now you're not just generating uh, translation in space, but you also uh, generate translations in time. So these are generators of space-time translations, so space and time. not the right dimensions, and you'll be right. Uh, so this is why, this is how uh, some quantum mechanics books uh, motivate each bar also. So this is another way to think about each bar, which is that it's the constant you stick into H and to G to, to make the dimensions right. Okay, because if you should think for yourself, what are, what, given what I've just written, what is the dimension of P? Right? And, and that is actually not that's actually not the uh, dimensions of momentum. Um, so what you find is that if you do stick in uh, H bar, then it becomes uh, the correct dimension. Uh, but, but I won't go there for the moment because my H bar is one anyway. Um, and it's not necessary. Here I claim it's not necessary to stick in the H bar. Right? Because so far I'm just talking about geometry and there's nothing quantum, not yet anything quantum in what I'm doing. But this side of the board is where I do want to promote it to something quantum. Uh, and, and so eventually we'll make contact. Right? But let me continue from here first. Uh, so it turns out that when you enlarge the group, then uh, I'm going to erase this, but I'm not going to erase this. Um, I'm going to show you what the whole, the whole group looks like. Yeah. What makes it unitary? You can, you can show that it is unitary. 
It's something that you can prove. Yeah, I, I'm not doing it now, but but you can show it. So yeah, so this is an also a good question because I forgot to say that this whole business was uh, uh, analyzed by Wigna. So Wigna was uh, uh, did a very very important piece of uh, theoretical physics, which is that he showed that basically um, symmetry transformations uh, acting on uh, quantum mechanical systems have to be either unitary or, un or anti-unitary. So if you can believe Lorentz, uh, the Lorentz symmetry is a symmetry of nature, then when it's acting on your quantum mechanical system, it better be uh, either a unitary or an anti-unitary operator. And it turned out that the only anti-unitary thing that I know about is the time reversal operator. Uh, parity, Lorentz, and Poincaré uh, is all all unitary, as far as I'm aware. Um, I don't I don't know of any other anti-unitary operators. Yeah. So it's a theorem basically. You can prove that when when it's acting on your Hilbert space, it has to be unitary or or anti-unitary. Yeah. Good. So let me continue. So what I want to say is that uh, you can also go ahead and work out the algebra between the j's and the p's and the p's themselves. So if you learn quantum mechanics, you probably will know that translations obviously commute. Right? So, uh, but, but that is, I hope, fairly obvious. Right? But with, uh, if you learn, I just appeal to undergraduate physics. Right? If you add vectors, um, the addition of vectors commute. Where v1 plus v2 is the same as v2 plus v1, and that itself is a statement that translations commute. Right? So, so what that means is that p mu commute over p nu has to be zero. This is just a statement that translations commute. Right? v1 plus v2 is the same as v2 plus v1. That's, that's basically a statement how I could want to uh, uh, do it in space time. Right? So that's basically it. Translations don't care uh, how which order you do them. But they don't they don't come in with these guys, which is why you need to look up the Observables. Right? So J mu nu and P 
uh, P alpha are not simultaneous observables. So, uh, 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 and th this is just a statement that, that you don't commute. Right? So, what are the simultaneous observables? In terms of this quantum language, uh, what you would say is that you need to look for or uh, what's called the Casimir operators. So, to know the Casimir operators. The Casimir operators are the operators that commute with everybody. So in this case, there are two. P squared, P mu, P mu, and what's called the uh, uh, square of the, in my book, they call it the mu. Uh, no, they call it C, C2. They are called C1. This is C2, and C2 is the square of what's called the Pauli Bolanski vector. So, what is the mu? The mu is called the Pauli Bolanski vector. And it's given by epsilon. And now I look up what the full dimension of the epsilon is mu nu alpha beta. Um, and then it's J nu alpha P beta. Okay. I think there's one part. Yeah, one part. So the four-dimensional that we read up, uh, for, for what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this 0, 1, 2, 3 equals to 1. And then I'm going to treat it as a tensor. Right, so what you discover is that because I'm using the because the uh, flat metric has an opposite sign for the time versus the space, this would mean that epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3 is actually minus 1. Okay. But uh, it would otherwise be very similar to the uh, uh, three-dimensional at which we got in the sense that um, it will be fully anti-symmetric. And so if you swap these guys, you will pick up a minus sign with each swap. Okay. But otherwise, uh, that's, that's how you define it. Right? So fully anti-symmetric. So because of these guys uh, commute, the C1 and C2 commutes with everybody. Therefore, they are simultaneous observables. You can, you can use them for simultaneous observables. You can use them to label the states. Okay? So again, the details I'm not going to um, uh, uh, tell you all the details, but let me at least try to give you the, the gist of it. Plus 
mass squared. That's just how you're taught at usually. Right? But what, what you should have been taught is that actually the relativistic way to write it is to say is P mu P mu and the zero component is in fact energy. Uh, P zero is in fact energy. Uh, and P i is the spatial part of it. And this will become M squared. Right? And so this is probably what you learned in, in, as an undergrad. But this is in fact a relativistic uh, uh, relativistically invariant way to, to, to describe particles. So uh, if you, know, you also know that in, uh, uh, in the case where you have a massive particle, P mu itself, uh, can, you can choose a frame where P mu is just at rest, meaning M, 0, 0, 0. Okay? So if if your if your uh, if your state is not at rest, you can always choose to boost it, and it doesn't change. Remember, it doesn't change the analysis to this guy, because if your since it commutes to everybody, right? So if I boost it, it has to be the same eigenvalue as uh, if I don't boost it, right? So this guy would. I can, I can commute through. And whatever eigenvalue it gives me it has to be the same as if I just, if I don't boost it. Right. So the same, it will spit out the same eigenvalue as if, if, if I don't boost it. I'm just write it out just to be very clear. Right. I, I, haven't I haven't told you about the eigen then I'm going to not put the subscript. Right? C is my Casimir operator. Uh, but since it commutes with everybody, if it acts on some boosted state, it will spit out the same eigenvalue as it doesn't if it if, if you don't boost it because it commutes with everybody. Right? So this is a key point. So you can exploit it to understand what are the range of eigenvalues you can get by boosting to a convenient frame. And in this case, if your map particle is massive, you will boost it to you will boost it to the rest frame. And what will happen is therefore uh, you can now look at for example P squared uh, on P on this thing. I I've already said gives you M M squared. But what about the Casimir operator, for example? So let's look at W first. Okay, so W, um, if you add W zero, uh, what is it? You will see that it's one half epsilon zero. But if this guy is zero, everybody else has to be a space index because you cannot have a repeated time index, right? So if you have one zero, then everybody else has to be space. Right? So that's the IJK. And so therefore, it's J, I, J, P, K. And this guy now acting on, think about it, acting on your moment, your P. Well, P, uh, P is now zero because it's now acting on, these are only the spatial components, and the spatial components acting on P is zero because I boosted it to a to a rest frame. Okay, I boosted it into a rest frame. So this is in fact zero. But what about what about the real i, the spatial components? This the real i is one half epsilon i, and then now we've got to uh, think about the different possibilities. I um, uh, let's say zero a b j zero a plus epsilon i uh, a b zero. In other words, the zero can be either on the j or on the p. And I think I need a factor of two. Uh, <coughs> I need a factor of two over here. So I erase this and put the one half here. Um, 
J A B P zero. Okay. So when W I acts on P, remember this is now energy. But any energy is now mass because I'm not in the rest frame. So W I acting on P <laughs> will give me uh, and this is zero because because again this act these are the spatial uh, components. This is energy, so it gives me m over two, and then this is in fact uh, epsilon i a b zero. So up to a minus sign, up to a minus sign. This is just a usual angular momentum operator, right? Because epsilon i a b j a b, which is in fact what we call minus m j i acting on P. Okay, but I just want to square. So let's square it. Okay, so when I square it, um, I'm going to erase this. Uh, when I square it, I can calculate now what it is. Uh, when I square it, because it may not be a high instead of this J, J I's. So it is the W mu W mu that is the eigen state. But the mu, the mu, the mu, we have discovered in this acting on this state will give us what? It will give us, because the mu, the mu zero is zero. The mu i, the mu i, so this is zero. So the mu i, the mu i acting on p is in fact now this guy here, minus, minus, minus is plus, so you get m squared, j squared, acting on P. Okay? But I just told you, sorry, I erased it already, but I just told you over here that from the angular length momentum algebra, J squared has the eigenvalues of spin. S times S plus 1. <clears throat> and this is exactly where spin comes from. Okay? So, uh, the, in other words, the uh, the spin of a massive particle comes from the J squared acting on these guys that leaves the momentum un unchanged. Okay, so, and, and so, uh, so massive, so let me just write it down. So massive states, massive states, Massive particles are labeled by uh, spin by spin s, and because of that, you also have an azimuthal number. M s can run from s to minus s, while spin s can be. Uh, remember, j squared can either be uh, zero, one half, one, three halves. And so on. Okay. And all these values can show up in your in your particles. D am I completely out of time now, so let me see. Um, okay, I am out of time. Any questions for me? So next time I talk about the massless case. So the massive case, uh, again, basically comes down to studying uh, uh, rotations in three dimensions because of because of this. Okay. So there is a um, there is a whole business of you know, formalizing it using little groups. So there's something called the little group, let me just mention it. The little group is the group that leaves uh, the reference momentum. This is the technical part that I'm not going to go into very much, but but in this case, basically, is this is this guy here the massive uh, uh, particle? You can always boost the resting, and you use this as your reference momentum, and it turns out that Whitmer showed that all the irreducible representations of the group that leaves this invariant will also be the representations of the bigger uh, Poincaré group. Okay. So it's a trick. He, he realized that you can just study the group 
that leaves this in, in there. And that representations, the representations of